Hi, I'm Mark. Thank you all for uh, thank you all for joining us. It's super exciting to meet a bunch of you in actual 3D after interacting online for uh, for a few years. Um, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about our kind of history and, and future of, of use of, of TLA Plus at AWS, uh, and uh, and I'll, a little bit about our formal methods practice more generally, and then quite personally about what I see as the challenges and opportunities for the future in this space. And so. Kind of talk-wise, we're going to talk about the past, we're going to talk about the present, and we're going to talk about the future um, in uh, approximately that order. Um, so let's start by talking about the past, and, and, and specifically, we'll kind of talk about my particular past and interest in this space. Um, to introduce myself, I've been at AWS for, uh, for 15 years. Um, all of those 15 years, I've carried a pager for an AWS service. Uh, the other day, I tried to estimate how many service outage post-mortems I'd read, both from AWS and across the industry, and came to a terrifying number around 3,000. Um, and so I tend to be quite operationally connected to our, uh, our services. And over my time, excuse me, I'm going to take my badge off so it doesn't rub on the mic. Um, over that time, I've worked on databases like, like Aurora, uh, compute systems like Lambda and EC2, uh, storage like EBS, and, uh, and some other offerings, our API gateway, some of our IoT offerings, a um, little bit on the AI side with offerings like Bedrock and SageMaker and a few others. I'm mostly a practitioner. Um, I mostly, uh, at least in theory, write code for a living um, and, uh, and, and build systems. And I'm mostly interested in large-scale distributed systems. Um, and, uh, and so that will be the angle across this whole talk. Uh, typically, you know, systems uh, of lots and lots of boxes, uh, thousands, millions of requests per second, petabytes, exabytes, and so on of data. And so large scale systems have been my interest throughout my career. Um, but we're gonna start a lot earlier and start with me in high school. One of the things that I really loved to do in high school was build circuits. I was like a really enthusiastic electronics hobbyist. And, uh, but not a particularly successful electronics hobbyist. Uh, I would build a lot of circuits. I would put them together on my breadboard or my Vero board, um, often release the magic smoke. Uh, things wouldn't quite work as I wanted them to. And a large part of that was because there was a set of patterns I kind of knew worked that I could repeat. There were a set of kind of old radio books that I owned that I could take things out of. But mostly, I didn't understand what I was doing. I didn't understand the core principles behind the things that I was doing. I was kind of pattern matching to, I want to solve this problem. I want to use this IC. I want to do this thing with a transistor. What have I done in the past that's kind of worked like this? How can I do that? And how can I pattern match against that? And so because of my interest in, in electronics, I, I went off to university and to study electrical engineering. And what I found there absolutely amazed me. What I found there was a foundation for building systems, electronic systems in this case, that was actually based in mathematics. It was actually principled. It was actually based on something other than just experimentation and pattern matching. And that is because of hundred ye hundreds of years of work um, by the folks on this slide and many, many more. You know, folks like Heaviside, uh, folks like Maxwell, um, and by bringing all of this mathematics to bear on the problems of electrical engineering, we could approach things in a much more principled way than just experimentation. And so with mathematics, we can quantify the output behavior of the systems that we're going to build, right? We can say, well, we've got this system under test. What does it do, right? What is the gain? What is the signal to noise ratio? What is the bit rate? All of these kinds of output metrics. But we can do something much, much more powerful even than that, is that we can predict the behavior of systems at design time, way before we've built them, way before we've invested in soldering things together or making PCBs or even sticking components into VeroBoard. We mostly know how things are going to work. And this is incredibly powerful because it lets us build systems at a scale and at an expense that is just not possible if you are just experimenting. 
We can understand the safety margins of our systems. If things fail, if things are too hot, if things are too cold, if there's noise from the outside, we can understand how those things work. And even more powerfully, we can understand the interactions between large-scale systems. And what's important about this is it's always within limits. None of these engineering laws that we have are perfect descriptions of reality. They are always estimations of reality. But that doesn't stop them from being incredibly powerful and incredibly useful to us. And so we end up with this kind of principled engineering loop where we can design systems, we can build systems, and we can run systems, and we can feed back from each of those states of the engineering flow into the earlier ones and learn, but we can design in a principled way, and we can be pretty sure before we go off and pay the expense and time of building something that the thing that we are designing is going to work. And this has allowed engineers and, and, and builders and, and us to, to build systems that are bigger and more complex than we could possibly afford to build or possibly risk to build without this set of tools. This is, in my estimation, awesome. It's about the coolest thing I know, right? I am just incredibly excited about this because I think it is one of the kind of foundational things that has made the last century what it has been. And I was so excited about this that after a short uh, diversion into the power transmission industry, I returned to university to do a PhD applying these principles to radar systems. And this is one of the diagrams we came up with. One of the traditional things that you can do with radars is that you can look at a target for the lo a long time, and the longer you look at a target, the sharper it gets and the more you know about how fast it's moving and where it is and so on. This is a classic approach to radar. But it turns out that if you don't know the exact time, and in single system radars, you don't know the exact time because clocks are always noisy. And in distributed radar systems where you have lots of receivers, you know the exact time even worse. Integration actually makes things worse. And so the more you learn, try and learn about a target, the less you know over time about where it is because everybody starts to tell you it's in different places. So I'm not going to go into that. It's, it's kind of a cool set of things. Um, but what was super powerful about this is we spent a bunch of time building up this theory of predicting how distributed radar systems work, and then we built a distributed radar system, and the system that we built performed almost exactly as we predicted it to. And there were a lot of frustrations of being at grad school and doing a PhD, but that is a day that I still remember, putting the two graphs next to each other and seeing that our predictions actually worked. It was so super cool that I just wanted to do that again and again. And so some time passed, and I decided to move into the, uh, I don't know, computer industry, the software industry. Um, and I was hoping what I would find there is a similarly principled engineering approach. Unfortunately, I was a little bit disappointed. When I spoke to folks, most folks, not everybody, not everybody, but most folks about the way that systems are designed, a lot of the answer was, yeah, it's just vibes, right? Like, oh, there's best practices and worst practices. And I read this blog post once where this guy said that this kind of thing is bad. Or, you know, this old CS professor wrote this ranty thing about why I shouldn't use go to. So I just don't use it because I don't feel like arguing with him. Um, and it, it was just super disappointing to me. And what I found very early was a huge amount of the kind of output quantitative thinking, which is, let's say, it's, it's very powerful, right? Like, how has the system worked? Well, we can look at its availability. We can look at its latency. We can look at its throughput. We can look at all of these output things. And there's a huge amount of this kind of output quantitative thinking in the industry. And it is kind of the way things are done. And, well, this is great. I'm not, I'm not saying this is bad in any way, but it is only a small part of the overall engineering picture. And so I kind of set off in this part of my career to uh, search for other solutions, search for people who wanted to think about the world the way that I did and were probably way ahead of me in, in thinking about these things. And uh, 
One of the problems that I was facing and trying to get a conceptual hand around was distributed state machines. And I, it, my definition here is probably more narrow than the wide one of what a distributed state machine is. But we have a resource, and in this case, a resource in the cloud. I was working on a cloud control plane at that point. Um, there can be in a variety of states. There's a variety of edges between those states that things can move between. And we have a stream from all kinds of different places, many, many input streams in many different orders, saying thing has moved from this state to that state, this state to that state, this state to that state. And the problem that I was trying to solve, the problem I was trying to get my hands around, was could we look at these streams and figure out what the real state of the thing was in a principled way? rather than writing all of this very heuristic code that says, well, if you see something move from the attached state to the detached state, you should probably believe that more than the other edge. And so was there a principled way of taking this state diagram or a state diagram like it and reasoning about what we can know about the ordering of events that we see? And if you've thought about problems like this before, you'll know that there's a whole kind of branch of mathematics looking at lattices and so on that is really, really smart and powerful. There's a whole bunch of thinking about monotonic programs, which is really powerful um, uh, you know, for, for these problems. But I have knew nothing about those at the time. And so I went around to my smartest colleagues and I asked, you know, how can we get our hands around these kinds of problems and stop writing kind of buggy heuristic code? And I came across a number of tools for doing that. Um, I came across Alloy, which I tried to apply to this problem. Folks have applied it to similar problems very successfully in the past. But I, I'll admit that I didn't make a great deal of progress. Um, I found Promela and Spin. Again, you know, very powerful tools that a lot of folks have had a lot of success with. Um, but I could never quite fit them into my mental model of the world. Maybe I just needed to spend some more time uh, with those particular tools. And then my colleague at the time, Chris, uh, told me about TLA Plus. And I bought Leslie's book and read all of the examples and started building a model of the system and a specification for its behavior in TLA Plus. And it completely changed my approach to engineering and thinking about these kinds of systems. And so with Chris and many others who were using a, um, TLA Plus in AWS, we got together in, in 2015, actually about 2013 when we started this, um, and wrote about our experiences applying TLA Plus at AWS. And we ended up publishing this paper in the communications of the ACM in, in 2015. Um, and this was a super fun thing to write. This was the first time, I think, that at AWS we had written about our application of TLA Plus to building systems. And so there's a, you know, six pages of paper, but there's only one really important part of it, as is the case with most papers, and it is table one. Uh, and in table one, we talk about, you probably can't see the whole thing, I'm not expecting you to read it, but in table one, we talk about our successes with TLA Plus and in what services we were finding that success. And so we talk about S3, DynamoDB, EBS, which is block storage, that's what, what I was working on, um, and this internal distributed lock manager, um, which is a clumsy name for an internal lock manager that we had built. Um, so let me go through the things that, that made me excited about this table. Um, you know, part one was we found three bugs, right? Uh, we found three bugs in, uh, in, in the DynamoDB protocol. We found three bugs in one of the core protocols of EBS um, and managed to fix our thinking and managed to get safety properties uh, that we really liked and managed to find and fix problems before they affected our customers. And so that's, that's obviously super powerful. The one that I liked even more than that was that some of these bugs required tens of steps in their traces to actually, uh, uh, to actually exercise. And that's why we weren't finding them with production, in production. This is why we weren't finding them with our traditional testing techniques. This is why our customers weren't tripping over them is because it required a lot of steps. But often, what happened is that these steps were rare in normal behavior, but they were very frequently triggered by failures, uh, by faults, by infrastructure failures. And so they were much more common. We just weren't asking the right questions in our testing about the behavior of the system under failure. 
And this was an incredibly humbling exercise, I think, for everybody who did it, right? We are really smart people. We've reasoned about this. We've built this system. We've bashed our heads on this code for years and years and years. And now this computer comes along and it says, oh, no, there are bugs in this. And it's, it's hard not to approach that and feel kind of deeply humbled about, wow, I'm not as smart as I thought I was. This problem is harder than it looks. But the one that excited me most is the last one, where we talked about verifying an aggressive optimization in one of our code bases. And as an engineer, this is super, super cool. Because what it means is that we can take what feels like more risk. We can add more complexity. We can do riskier, further out things to reduce costs, to improve performance without actually taking in production risk, right? We can understand an optimization before deploying it, and that allows us to optimize more, it allows us to optimize earlier, it allows us to drive down costs earlier, drive up efficiency, which has great benefits for us and our customers. And so this was a combination of great properties, right? Not only was TLA Plus able to make us build systems that were faster, and to build systems faster, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. We can build systems that are safer by finding those violations of the safety properties earlier, before they get into production. And we can build systems that are cheaper, faster, more efficient, uh, and easier to run, and all of these other good things. This is just starting to feel like good engineering practice, right? And so we can go back to the 1850s. This is a quote that I really love. I'm sorry, it's a little bit long. Uh, this guy, Arthur Wellington, wrote this book, really thick book, about how to choose where to put railways. Um, it's not super relevant, most of it, but I just love this quote, where he talks about how engineering is not the art of constructing, it is the art of not constructing. It is the art of doing well with one dollar, which any bungler can do with two after a fashion. And, you know, this is a little bit rude, but it's true. Right? This is the core of what has become centuries of engineering practice. And as computer systems and large-scale distributed systems have become so incredibly important to the world and the world's economy, this has become the core of what has become computer engineering practice. And so I think of TLA Plus not really as a tool for science or a tool for mathematical reasoning or you know, one of these other great things that people use it for, I think, it for, I think of it as a design time tool that accelerates our engineering practice. We can move on to talk about the present. So we wrote that paper in 2015, which incredibly, or wrote it in 2014, which incredibly was an entire decade ago. Um, it's kind of terrifying. Um, and so what, you know, what has changed since then? Well, we continue to use TLA Plus quite heavily across AWS. Um, and our practice has become a lot wider, but we are still using TLA Plus in our database services organization, including Aurora and DynamoDB, on our compute services, including Lambda, our serverless compute service, uh, in our storage services like EBS, and in many other places in AWS. And it is, continues to be a core enabling technology that allows us to build efficient, high performance distributed systems. And so to pick one example, uh, we, uh, we published this paper in 2020. It's called Millions of Tiny Databases about part of the design of the control plane of, of EBS. Um, and this describes a, a very large distributed database system of, with, with rather simple semantics. Uh, but we use TLA Plus very heavily in the construction and design of this system. And in the paper, we say we use TLA Plus in three ways writing specifications of our protocols to check that we understand them deeply, model checking specifications against correctness and liveness properties using the TLA, TLC model checker, and writing extensively commented TLA, TLA plus code to serve as the documentation of our distributed protocols. While all of these three use added value, TLA plus's role as extremely precise format for documentation was perhaps the most useful. 
And this was a surprise to me at the time. It was a surprise to me because I was one of the relatively few people when we started this project and my team who was using TLA Plus was still seen as this fairly arcane thing. But going through the exercise of writing very precise specifications and writing models of our systems and heavily commenting those with the reason they were the way they are really helped the team implement quickly, test quickly, choose the right tests to build, choose the right optimizations to make, and so on. And that's something that I think is an underrated and maybe under-talked about benefit of these kinds of tools in helping be crisp documentation. Beyond TLA+, AWS has developed over the last decade a broad uh, automated reasoning and formal methods practice uh, across uh, a large number of tools. Um, I, you know, our, our publication record in automated reasoning has, has several hundred papers, and so I'm going to just pick a few that I think are particularly exciting. So this one from 2024, so this year, um, is called CEDAR, a new language for expressive, fast, safe, and analyzable authorization. So CEDAR is this language for implementing authorization policies, right? Like, here is what this person can do to this system, what resources they can touch, what actions they can take, and so on. And it turns out that authorization is an incredibly deep hole with a huge amount of subtlety. Everything in this space is difficult. There are all kinds of difficult trade-offs. And what the CEDA folks did, which I thought was so cool, was designed this authorization language to be analyzable, designed it from the ground up to be something that was amenable to using formal tools to reason about as a first-class design principle of the language that they built. I thought this was a really cool way to approach a tough problem. Here's another one, message chains for distributed system verification. Um, this was some work that, that some interns and, and some visiting folks did at AWS around the P language of developing this tool uh, for using reasoning about the ordering of messages using these message chains to more quickly uh, reason about or more efficiently reason about and check uh, the behavior of systems implemented in P. Uh, so P is a language for uh, implementing um, models and specifications of distributed systems in a way that is quite opinionated about them being distributed state machines. Um, and, uh, and so this paper uh, found faster ways to do model checking, bounded model checking on P. This is a paper that really excited me when it came out. This is about um, a system called Zelkova that, uh, that the S3 folks built to check authorization in S3. And one of the tricky things about building and running the cloud is that we have built our authorization systems up over time. There are many layers. Those layers interact. And so we want to be able to reason about the interactions between all of those layers so we can say something super precise and crisp to customers about their behavior. Um, and that's what Zelkova was able to do. But the really cool thing about this is that the problem, the core problem that Zelkova uh, does or, 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 or performs is P-space complete. And what's exciting about that is, you know, at least me when I was studying sort of computer science, this idea that we can take algorithms or problems that are P-space complete or NP-complete and actually do them in production seemed wacky, right? Like NP-complete was this kind of shorthand for, well, you know, don't bother. But Zelkova, what Zelkova does is da solves billions of these P-space complete problems every single day in production with tight bounds and other things. I thought this was super cool. Um, just from a, you know, computer science perspective, and it's a cool system too. Another paper I really enjoyed was, uh, was this one from the, again, from the S3 folks who do a, do a ton of great work in this space um, about using lightweight formal methods to validate a key value store node. And so this is the node that actually stores the bits and bytes in S3. Um, it is a vast amount of data, and it is just an incredibly important amount of data. Uh, it, it might not even be an exaggeration to say this is the single most important computer system in the world. I mean, it sounds weird to say, but it just might actually be true. Um, and what these folks did was applied a wide set of what they call lightweight formal methods 
to aid the reasoning about the correctness of the code that was actually going into production. Um, and, uh, and that's pretty exciting. It's a, it's a cool paper um, with a very, very engineering focus about a real built system, which I enjoyed. So keeping this a little bit personal about the, uh, or going back to my journey um, and, uh, and talking about how my practice has, has evolved over time. And mostly it has evolved by adding tools to my tool set. Um, I still use TLA Plus uh, fairly frequently, although not as frequently as I used to. Um, I use P more and more often. Um, I find that uh, P is an easier language for most engineers to approach. Um, for a variety of reasons, some of which might be controversial in this room, and some of them might be obvious. Um, but one of the reasons that it is that it is more opinionated, it's less general, and that makes it easier to map distributed systems type problems into P than it is to map them into TLA+. Plus. It requires less of this kind of conceptual leap between the model of uh, P's understanding of the world and the distributed systems engineer's understanding of the world, which makes it easier to use in some ways. The code level tools like, um, like Daphne and, and Carney, these are, these are open source, um, that allow you to implement programs in a verifiable way, allow you to verify um, certain properties of Rust code. Uh, there is a, um, a deterministic simulation framework called Turmoil that we, uh, that we built and, and released as open source that allows you to deterministically simulate uh, distributed systems built in Rust. Um, and is that, that is a part of being able to kind of explore the whole space of, of failures and reorderings and so on against the real code. And so that's more of a kind of principled testing approach than it is a formal approach. Um, and then slowly over the last few months, I've been starting to learn Lean. Um, Lean is an incredibly cool, incredibly powerful tool. I'm just only scratching the surface of it, but it seems like something that is going to be more and more important to my practice over the next few years. And so I continue to be excited about TLA Plus. And as, as I've moved into more of a kind of leadership position uh, at AWS, I have continued to encourage our engineering teams to pick it up. And there are several reasons for that. One of them is that finding bugs earlier allows us to move faster. This is a kind of classic idea in, in computer engineering. Um, and there's been a lot of debate about this for decades. But in my mind, the earlier you find bugs, the cheaper it is, the faster you can move. Finding bugs in a production system is really bad for two reasons. One of them is it means that it's probably impacted customers and the availability and durability, integrity and security of our systems is our number one mission and so we don't want that to happen. And the other is that fixing bugs in production is incredibly expensive and difficult. We are able to move fast, we deploy often, we deploy quickly, but we still have a global scale infrastructure that is hard and risky to change. And so if you can find bugs at design time, when it's still two or three pieces of paper, instead of a globally distributed system, changing and fixing those systems is just vastly orders of magnitude, easier and cheaper and faster. And that makes TLA plus something that, and the rest of these tools, things that can save us a bunch of engineering time. It's not some kind of you know, wonky mathematical reasoning point, it's a very practical point of this, saves us time and money and makes our systems more reliable. It allows us to optimize our designs and protocols without risk. One of the hardest decisions that engineers need to make is, is the complexity of this optimization worth it? Adding complexity to systems makes those systems less reliable. It makes those, the behavior of those systems less predictable. And so every time we add a complex optimization to a system, we need to make a budgeting decision. And what these tools allow us to do is make those decisions ahead of time, reduce that risk by being more sure about the behavior change that is going to be, uh, that is going to be introduced into our system, and so allow us to optimize more and optimize further. This decreases costs, it, it decreases power, it decreases infrastructure spend, it decreases data center footprint. These are all things that we are deeply 
interested in and excited about, and it decreases the cost for our customers, which our customers are also deeply excited about. It improves performance and improves performance predictability. These tools allow us to crisply communicate exact reasoning and the exact properties of systems, both internally and externally. And so this is one of the cool things. If you think about what Zelkova does, Zelkova is this deep reasoner that can look over a whole bunch of different authorization systems and policies and tell you super crisply, is this S3 bucket accessible from the outside? It's a really simple, common sense question that anybody building on AWS cares about. Um, and being able to crisply communicate a yes or no answer to that instead of a, well, here is reams and reams and reams of reasoning and so on, is extremely powerful. And this applies not only to those kinds of accessibility properties, it applies to things like consistency properties, it applies to da database isolation, it applies to all kinds of other places where we want to say to customers, yes, this is consistent, yes, this is linearizable, yes, this is serializable, and here is the exact reasoning why. And we can use that reasoning internally uh, to move faster on and to understand our systems better. And so I believe and continue to believe that formal methods, automated reasoning, TLA plus, are just good engineering practice. This is just the way that building, it, it, they are just tools that allow us to build systems faster, more efficiently, to build systems that are more efficient, to communicate more crisply with our stakeholders, with our customers, and with our own teams. And so I, you know, this, I, th I think there are a lot of folks who would look at the slide and say, yeah, that, that's been my experience too. But a huge percentage of the engineers working in the, this industry would see this statement and think it, that it is just completely disconnected from reality. It is deeply and completely disconnected from their beliefs and assumptions about formal methods and about automated reasoning. And so that's why I care about it so much. Because I think that we as a community have done a great job building a cool set of tools, but we still haven't succeeded in getting this thought, if you believe it, but I do, into the heads of the engineers and even the engineers who are building the world's largest scale distributed systems. And this doesn't apply always, right? Like there are thousands and thousands of systems that don't need this level of rigor. You know, there are lots and lots of folks who are building line of business systems uh, where the, uh, you know, the, the requirements are just super fuzzy and super human and all of these other things where it is difficult and probably not right to apply this level of rigor. The world runs on Excel spreadsheets, many of which are kind of discovered properties of systems by people who would not think of themselves as programmers but absolutely are programmers. And maybe they would benefit from formal, in fact, a lot of them would benefit from formal rigor, but it might not be a good engineering practice in those places. But for those who are building distributed systems, building complex single system, single machine systems, I believe that the statement is true and I believe that we have failed to clearly communicate with the engineering community in the world about that. So into the future, more exciting note. Um, prediction one, this is a very safe one. Systems will continue to become more complex. Why will systems continue to become more complex? Because the world is continuing to become more complex. Uh, we are being pushed by our customers to build cool things for them that they need. We are being pushed by regulators in all kinds of ways. We are being pushed by the laws of physics. We are being pushed by the need for more sustainability to build systems in a more and more complex environment. Complexity is in some ways the enemy, but it is also the enabling tool that we have to react to the way that our world is changing. I think it is a safe bet to believe that the systems a decade out are more, will be more complex on average than the systems we're building today. I don't see a world where that doesn't happen. And I think what this means for us is that the need for tooling, the need 
to do what those electrical engineers and electrical engineering researchers and scientists of old did for electrical systems is going to become more and more and more critical for large-scale computer systems. And we are going to have to adapt to this complexity because very soon, if it hasn't happened already, and it probably has, very soon the behavior of these systems will exceed our ability as humans to reason about them without much, much more powerful abstractions and tools than we have available to us today. And at the same time, systems will continue to become more critical. We have seen in our own lives how computers have gone from this kind of minor hobby, this thing that people were excited about, to something that is just a defining and critical part of our lives, of the world's economy, that people depend on every day. And that's kind of snuck up on us in a way. And it's just going to keep happening. And it's just going to keep happening because the economic engine that is driving that is just, at this point, essentially unstoppable. And so what does this mean for us, that these systems become more critical? It means that we need to, that these properties that we talk about, these things that we call safety properties and liveness properties, become more and more part of people's everyday lives. Right? They are become less and less abstract and more and more part of the concrete world in which we live. Prediction three, cost, efficiency, sustainability, and productivity will continue to become more important. It's hard to argue with this one. Again, it is like a very fundamental kind of economic feedback loop. We're never going to look at a system and say, wow, I, think that, I wish that thing was more expensive. We're never going to look at a system and say, wow, I wish that thing involved pumping more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We're never going to look at an engineering team and say, well, I wish those folks got less done. Um, and so, the, again, our ability to build tools that help us be more efficient, to lower costs, to be more sustainable, and to be more productive is an extremely important part of what I think the folks in this room and in the broader automated reasoning and formal methods community can bring. And prediction number four is AI will be a big deal. That's about all I can say about that. But I think it's going to turn out to be something. <laughs> something. The future, more concretely. OK, so those are some big ideas. Let's talk about some more specific ones in our last couple of minutes here. Um, one of the things that I really would like these tools to do is help me reason more about, have a, more about the quantitative behavior of systems. Um, and there are folks in this room who've done some really cool work in that direction. Um, there are folks who are kind of way ahead of me in talking about this. But this is something that I'm very excited about. And so when I pick up a tool um, like P or like TLA+, Plus, I want to build my system inside that tool, and I don't want to only ask these really kind of binary questions about my safety properties and my liveness properties. I want to ask these questions like, what is the probability that this thing is going to fail if these components of it fail with these probabilities? Right? I know a lot about component failures, right? Because I can go and look at history of running large-scale systems and know how likely it is that any component's going to fail, know how likely correlated failures between components are going to be. But it's really hard for me to plug that data into these tools and ask them to put it together with the design of the system and tell me what the kind of output availability is going to be. Again, I want to plug in network latency and throughput distributions and get an a output distribution of here is the distribution we were going to see of output latency. Here is the distribution you're going to see of throughput. I want to be able to model system performance under different workloads. Uh, and this was one that like, is just super important to me in my database work. Right? One of the really interesting things in the database field is the difference between workloads and relatively similar workloads can be many orders of magnitude in difficulty for getting to high throughput or difficulty to getting to high scale. And so if you think about the kind of really classic distributed hash table workload that spreads its work over a huge space, those things are kind of embarrassingly scalable. But one engineer changes one line that adds 
a incremental counter where we've got to put like plus one every time we insert something. And suddenly that problem has gone from embarrassingly scalable to almost completely non-scalable. And so what is the shape of that kind of workload space? And how will my system behave at different points within it? And then I want to be able to automatically optimize system designs. I want to be able to look at a description of a system and have a computer help me reason about the optimizations I can make to that system. And more broadly, I want to be able to explore the design space of distributed systems in a automated way, right? I want to be able to say, here is my workload, here is my set of workloads, here are my assumptions about the world, here are my input properties, what is the optimal kind of workload I'm, or optimal system I could build that goes into this space box? Let me make that a little bit concrete. So there's 30 years plus, maybe 40, of debate about this fundamental idea of how do we replicate data between systems in a distributed system. And one of the ways to cut that space is do I use a sort of quorum style protocol, a consensus style protocol, these sort of two F plus one protocols like Paxos, or do I use an F plus one protocol like chain replication? And this is something that, I mean, it's kind of weird, right? We've been talking about this for 30 years. What is the state of how I make that decision as an engineer, as a new distributed systems engineer? What is this grab bag of stuff across blogs and books and people's opinions and so on? Imagine we were there with like, you know, transistors or capacitors or electric motors or something where it was just like, okay, well, you know, here's a bunch of opinions. It's, it's weird. So what I want to be able to do is say, here are my workload properties, here are the properties of the world that I live in. What is the right design? to pick. Here's another example. Optimistic concurrency versus pessimistic concurrency control, or OCC versus locking. Classic database problem. The literature has been arguing about this for 45 years, maybe 50 years. That's significantly longer than I've been alive, and we still don't have a clear winner. And why don't we have a clear winner? We don't have a clear winner because it is really dependent on the workload. It's really dependent on our assumptions about how things fail. It's really dependent on the amount, the latency it takes to do certain things, the amount of throughput that's available. And so, but I should be able to, because I know a lot of those workload properties, I should be able to take all those workload properties and say, in an automated principled way, which of these things is better? And I just can't do that today. If you want to read some classic CS papers, um, you know, CS Kung stuff from the late 70s and early 80s is, uh, is a really good time. Um, I think it's really important, as you've heard, for us to reach working engineers uh, and reach working engineering managers and working engineering executives. Um, and because I, I, I truly believe that applying these tools is good engineering practice. And I think we can get together and do more in moving the whole field forward. How do we do this compared to what we've been doing before? Well, I, I don't know. Um, uh, I think there's a whole lot of things that we can try, a whole lot of things that we have tried, um, a whole lot of things that I continue to try by telling this story over and over. One of the thoughts that I have is, you know, should tools be narrower and more specific? Um, I've certainly seen uh, engineers engage with P more easily than they engage with TLA+. Plus. Um, but there are downsides to that too. I think, you know, one of the real powers that TLA+, Plus has is getting people into this really sort of abstracted space and and making them not, uh, you know, sort of getting them out of their comfort zone reasoning-wise. And so I don't actually know which is the right answer to that, but I think we're going to need to sort of try a bunch of things. Um, is packaging and UI holding us back? Uh, the packaging and UI around TLA Plus is vastly better than it was thanks to a bunch of members of this community, um, and is actually quite, quite nice and quite pleasant and quite fun. Um, but it's still not right there in my IDE, right? Like when I open VS Code or whatever, it still doesn't feel like it's right to hand in the way that uh, a lot of the other tools that engineers use are, you know, right there in their IDE, in their developer experiences. And then are we speaking enough with decision makers about how these tools can help them move faster and with less risk? Um, I think the answer to that at AWS is, is probably yes, we're, we're starting to have the right level of those conversations, but I don't get the sense that that's true across the whole industry. 
um, you know, when I see folks talk about applying formal methods and automated reasoning, they're still very much talking about uh, correctness properties. They're to still talking about safety. They're still talking about aliveness. And those things are, I'm just being clear, critically important. But I don't think we're telling the story to engineering decision makers enough about how these tools can help us build systems uh, that are cheaper, that are cheaper to build, and have lower risk, more lower cost, more sustainable, and so on. The other thing that's often on my mind in this space is this kind of classic code versus model gap. Um, you know, hey, this is the this is the thing that people uh, you know bring up as soon as you start talking about formal automated reasoning tools. They say, well, what if the code that I write doesn't match this model that I built, doesn't actually match my specification. And I think a lot of the folks in this space are kind of dismissive of this point and kind of dismissive of it for some good reasons, right? Like it actually hasn't turned out, at least in my experience, to be as much of a big issue as folks make it out to be. But I also think that we lose people when we are dismissive about that gap. Right, because it isn't a bad question. How do I know, right? How can I take this very principled reasoning that I was doing about the properties of my system and then say, hand wave, hand wave, now there's code, <laughs> right? I think people are right to be worried about what goes into that hand wave, hand wave, because we're telling them that hand wave, hand wave on the design isn't okay. And so, you know, I, as a kind of call to action for this community, I think we need to be a little bit more thoughtful about the way that we talk about this. Um, you know, not, not let it be a spoiler, but really do, uh, do think a lot more, maybe, about, uh, about how it affects the way that, that folks see this kind of work. And then the one I'm least decided about is this kind of model checking versus proof gap. Um, this is the folks that the real automated reasoning people, of which I am not one, uh, get real excited about. Um, you know, what, when can we use the word proof uh, versus model checking? Uh, when should we be talking about, um, uh, about soundness? Uh, you know, what, how much does that actually matter? What is quote unquote mere bug finding uh, versus actual proof? Um, I don't know what the answers to these are. Um, and I think, but I, I, I do think that we end up kind of talking past each other on these topics a fair amount. And, I think one of the things that is important in the relationship between you know, the scientists and mathematicians and the engineers is coming to a common understanding of the relative value of proof um, about the assumptions behind those proofs and the relative value of kind of mere bug finding um, in, and, uh, and kind of non-sound model checking approaches, these kind of lightweight formal methods. I don't have a prescription for what's right here, but I do think we lose some people uh, to this kind of conversation. Um, well, I remain extremely excited about this space. That's why I'm here today. Uh, and so thank you all. Um, I didn't want to end that on a downer. Um, and so I will say I'm extremely excited about TLA Plus. I'm extremely excited about automated reasoning and formal methods. And I think they are a critical part of the way that we are going to evolve the practice of building large scale computer systems over the next decade. Cool, thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was a, a fantastic kickoff. Um, I think as our next speakers uh, get set up, uh, we might have a couple minutes for yeah. questions. Yeah. If anybody has, has questions that they would like to ask. Sure. Thanks, I'll start again. Uh, I have a question about evolution. Um, software changes over time, people come and go. Uh, requirements change, you know, designs change over time. So uh, I just wanted to hear about your experience in, in perhaps accommodating change with, with TLA plus and formal tools. Yeah, that's, uh, I think, probably, a, 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 you know, just something I should have had a slide about. Uh, it, it's, it's a super important question. Um, I think there's a whole spectrum of, of the speed of change, right? When I think about a system like EBS, the fundamental requirement of, I'm gonna put these bytes down onto disk, when I read them, they must not have changed, and they must still be there when I read them in a year. Those things aren't changing very fast. 
I think more at the more sort of business logic end, you know, the places where, um, you know, the, the, the sort of customer facing APIs and UIs, the speed of change is very, very fast. Um, and so what we need is a whole kind of spectrum of methods to say, you know, here are the parts of our specification that are unchanging. You know, here are the parts that are changing fast and kind of dial up like where, you know, where in the spectrum are we going to verify to? Um, and, uh, you know, as far as, as far as dealing with change, I think, uh, I think you have to engage, uh, w one of the values that we get out of these tools is being able to engage engineers and product managers in being able to answer, ask really, really crisp questions. And so often, you know, when customers come and say, we have these requirements, there'll be these really, really fuzzy things, right? Uh, because that's, you know, it's not their job to figure, the, figure them out for us. And one of the great things about these tools is they allow us to take those fuzzy things customers are asking for and turn them into just incredibly crisp things, which helps with that speed of change. I don't know if that's a great answer to your question, but it's, uh, it's the one I got. Maybe we can uh, let, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. let the next speaker set up and we can get to your question. So this is about the quantitative aspects uh, that you can model. I remember reading your blog post, like formal methods only solve half my problems, I think it was mm -hmm. called. And I think you had a follow-up blog post about just using Python simulations for mm -hmm. systems. I might be misremembering. Yep. Uh, do you think, is, is that like the current state of the art, in your opinion, of this kind of thing? Is just, you basically just write up a model of your system in Python and kind of let it rip? Yeah, I don't know if that's the state of the art. Uh, that is the state of my personal practice. Uh, there's been some cool work on that in TLA Plus. There's been some cool work on that in P. Um, I've, I've seen some nice successes with those, but typically when I'm you know, reaching into the bag of techniques, those are the two that I, I'm still pulling out. Um, and uh, I would like that not to be the case. And, and partially that's just you know, my, my ignorance of what the best thing is, and, and partially that is, I think, a reflection of where the tools are today. Cool, thank, thank you. Thank you. Another hand for Mark.